Welcome, welcome everybody. Uh, first of all, I want to DMV. Can I'm doing a sound check? Can you uh, say yes if you can hear me? Or if anybody can hear me? Yes. Awesome. Okay. Perfect. So I, I just want to kind of set the tone again uh, for the, this morning's event. Uh, we're, we're here with two awesome speakers, Sh Sh Sinead and Alex uh, from Bright Flag. Sinead Kinney is the manager and customer insights, and Alex Kelly is the CEO and co-founder. Uh, today's topic, Beyond Cost Savings, the broader case for legal spin management. I we, we, we will be recording today's topic, and I will be following up with a copy of the slide deck and, and the recording uh, in the next day or so. Um, with that said, I just want to jump in. If there's any questions throughout, uh, please uh, please put them in the, the chat box. I'm going to address them. And uh, at the end, uh, we're going to run for about 45 minutes. At the end, we're going to open up uh, for some some further questions. Um, we did put in uh, two, two chart polls uh, to kind of get your engage, engagement throughout. Um, so I see like we have about 13, 14 people coming in. So I'm going to make an announcement really quick before... Sinead and Alex formally introduced themselves and we kicked this off. Uh, so, so this week, uh, legal operators, we were delighted to add Akshay Verma to our, our advisory board, who's going to be really focusing on the, the fifth pillar of legal operations, which is diversity and empowerment, trying to go a step further than inclusion. And with that, we've got some initiatives rolled out with law firms. Akshay will be focusing on building out and really identifying companies like Bright Flag that are just doing like next level things to solve problems. Um, other than that, I just I, I just want to flag that we will be rolling out a legal technology hub in the next eight weeks. Um, I want to put it on your radar, and we will also be bringing a technology directory and a place for legal operations folks to interact seamlessly um, on a platform. With that, I'm going to hand it off to both Sinead and Alex to do a brief introduction to themselves and kick this morning's program off. We're really excited to hear, hear what we have to hear about cost and savings. Thanks, guys. Take it away. Thanks, Colin. And thank you all for joining us today. We're really excited to be here. By way of introduction, as Colin mentioned, I'm one of the two original co-founders of Bright Flag, a corporate lawyer in a previous life. In practice, I now spend a lot of my time working with legal departments and legal operations professionals, helping them to understand how the Bright Flag AI-powered spend and matter management platform can underpin the maturity journeys for their legal departments. I'm delighted to be joined by my colleague, Sinead Kenny, one of the longest standing members of the Bright Flag team. Sinead has been instrumental in implementing effective data-driven strategies across many of our clients. Sinead, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Thank you, Alex. And thanks, everybody, for joining today. Um, as Alex said, we're very excited to talk about this topic. Um, I myself am with Bright Flag for almost five years now. Um, before that, I was a corporate lawyer as well, so sat on the other side of the fence for a little while. Um, what I do with our clients is ensure that they get maximum value from the platform. And that's why this topic today is very close to my heart, because the broader case for legal spend management and you know the main outcome for me when i'm working with my clients is to ensure that our clients derive a wide range of value from the platform so i'll hopefully uh, bring to life some of the, the points that we we talk about today on the on this webinar for you so looking forward to getting stuck into it thanks Sinead. um uh, as we know, direct cost savings have always been a clear and compelling reason to strengthen your legal spend and matter management strategy. But we're certainly now learning that the value goes well beyond the purely financial and it also improves the quality of legal work. It, it enhances operations and can help transform key relationships for the department as well. So Sinead and myself are going to explore the unexpected value teams are realizing as they advance towards a more proactive style of legal spend and matter management. We're going to be focusing on three key areas of additional value. Firstly, the growing ability of legal teams to engage in what we term proactive cost control and the benefits of doing so. Secondly, we'll delve into what advanced automation means to legal operations particularly in freeing up time for more impactful projects and work. And finally, how the legal department can start to build strong data-driven relationships with key stakeholders 
as a result of spend and matter management strategy, which ultimately drive better business results. Certainly, our goal for today's session is that it will provide you with practical takeaways and will be as interactive as possible. So Sinead will be sharing real world examples of how our clients have realized benefits in each of, the, of these three key areas. And we'll also be asking all of you for your feedback on the three key themes. Please also feel free to submit questions as we go through and we'll, we'll do our very best to answer those uh, at, the, at the end. So to kick things off, we're going to discuss how legal departments can transition from what we would classify as reactive to proactive cost control strategies and the benefits of doing this. So what do we mean by proactive versus reactive cost control? In our experience, many legal departments are struggling to even get to a point of having reactive cost controls in place over the last mile of the process. For instance, having an invoice review and approval process to find, ensuring rates are being checked, budgets are being applied, and billing guidelines are being applied to uh, invoice uh, data and to spend data. But certainly it's surprising in our experience how quickly legal departments can transition from not even having these reactive controls in place to moving beyond them and implementing proactive cost control strategies. So certainly what we consider to be these reactive, more tactical measures at the last mile of the process are certainly very important and foundational. It is surprising how quickly departments and teams can move beyond them to, to more proactive strategies. So. What we've highlighted here are some examples of these proactive cost control strategies that we're going to be delving into. And we certainly see clients successfully adopt them with their law firms and their legal service providers. And the value that these proactive approaches deliver is essentially and ultimately delivering better quality legal services in a more predictable way and ultimately enabling much more fundamental changes for the legal department and how work is being resourced. And examples of these include driving law firm behavior changes in how they actually resource the work, the broadening usage of alternative fee arrangements, enabling teams to set more accurate and granular budgets on matters that drive greater predictability, and certainly ultimately becoming more prescriptive with vendors about how work should be resourced in matters, ensuring the right work is being done by the right level of seniority uh, for the task. Um, and ultimately being put, putting, putting your team in a position where you can negotiate better fee arrangements, better rates uh, with all of this data. As I said, in our experience, for a variety of reasons, legal departments often struggle to get beyond the, the tip of the iceberg, beyond the reactive controls to focus on these more proactive, high impact initiatives, whether due to a lack of usable data or, to, uh, or a lack of time to dedicate to these activities. So. What we'd like to do, uh, firstly, is run a first poll, a poll. I, might, I might ask Colin to run that before we, we get Sinead's perspective on this. So we'd like to understand currently uh, how you would describe your current cost control strategy. What proportion of your time are you spending on proactive as opposed to reactive uh, initiatives? Um, and, and, and where do you think things currently sit? And obviously these results are entirely anonymous, so you can be completely candid about where things are today. And, uh, and certainly in our experience, uh, a lot of departments are, are focusing on getting to that first stage of reactive controls um, before turning their attention to those more proactive measures I mentioned. So we'll just give everybody a moment to, to submit their, uh, their responses. Hey, Alex. Um, hey, the way we set this up, I, I set it up through three questions. So we're going to get a lot of, uh, we're, we're going to get the three questions answered pretty pretty quickly so we can, you, you'll see when I end. Great. Great. Okay. So question three is question one. So we might just give up. Another moment before we get started.
Thoughts, Alex? Sinead? Yeah, so, so this is interesting. Um, we're, we're just talking about uh, the first one. How, how would you currently describe your cost control strategy um, initially? So um, feedback, 20% uh, of people um, uh, feeling that uh, they're more proactive than reactive. I'm sorry, I've just lost the... Yeah, I got your slide. So, so certainly, I, I think it's probably reflective of, of where we see a lot of legal departments um, not, not quite at a point yet where they're really engaging in more proactive measures and, and, and still at a point where reactive measures are, are taking up more of their, more of their time and, and their, uh, their bandwidth. Um, in terms of uh, getting Sinead's perspective on this, um, Sinead, I suppose mm -hmm. these are interesting results um, and the, the reality is I think a lot of clients would love to, to have stronger, more proactive controls in place. Could you maybe share with us some examples of proactive strategies you've seen clients successfully adopt leveraging data and, and maybe give, give some context on the benefits they've seen from those approaches? Yeah, of course. Um, I think every client that I work with, you know, when, when we start the process of working with them, you know, um, one of their main goals is to move away from being reactive to being more proactive. They often describe it as moving away from firefighting and um, to where they're actually kind of, you know, being more proactive and how they're setting out the, the uh, engagement with their law firms. Um, uh, you know, we have a couple of different themes that we've listed here in terms of proactive um, strategies that have employed uh, have been employed by clients. One big thing that we see is the change in, in billing behavior. So obviously when you implement um, a platform to help you manage your legal spend, there are a number of different benefits that flow from that and they feed into a proactive strategy very well. Um, of course, it can't be understated that the value in just digitizing the invoice process um, brings about so many different um, you know, benefits to the legal operations team and the legal team as a, as a whole. It'll mean that the, you know, the invoice submission is more streamlined, there's much better visibility and transparency. And as we'll talk about a little later on, that has a knock-on positive impact on the relationship with the different stakeholders that you engage with. Um, but one particular example of where we had a client implement Brightflag, obviously, um, and they were able to kind of get a much more granular analysis on what the, the law firm were doing in terms of their behaviours, um, was a, a, a technology company who were running a bet the company litigation, essentially. And they were at a point, incredibly reactive, they kind of just felt, well, this is such an important case, we just have to kind of accept everything that's happening in terms of how the law firm is resourcing it. And um, when they switched Bright Flag on, there were just a number of data points that they couldn't ignore. One in particular, particular internal communications. So it was very high on this particular matter. And um, by taking that data and having an informed conversation, so the GC in this particular case was very proactive. He had a, a kind of relationship discussion with the law firm and um, he kind of showed them the data point and um, there were about maybe four different firms on this matter and one in particular was excessive with their internal communications so having had that conversation showing the objective data very quickly we were able to see a change in that law firm's billing behavior so they quickly modified you know the extent to which internal communications were occurring on the invoices so that's just one example of where looking at the data being proactive in your conversation with your firms will help move the dial and, and bring you to that more proactive um, position. Other that, examples of... Mm -hmm, sorry, sorry, Sinead, yeah, that's really interesting. I'm interested as well as how are you seeing uh, corporate legal departments become more prescriptive with law firms about how they resource the work outside of maybe the internal communications, but maybe around the level that work is being done at? How, how have you seen clients use data to inform those decisions? Sure, well, that's another kind of proactive strategy that clients want to start doing very quickly once they start using Bright Flag. Um, they'll want to ensure that the right person is doing the right work at the right rate. And how you do that is again through data. So you know, I have one particular client, um, they have high IP litigation spend. And their approach up until quite recently was, look, we always go to this firm, they're very good, we know how they work, and, and they didn't really look beyond that. 
obviously when they started to get reports like on the blended rate, on the resourcing level at the task level, um, they also kind of looked just generally at the costs. They realized that it was predominantly being staffed at a, at a very high uh, resourcing level. So in using the data, they were able to go back to the law firm and kind of like be much more prescriptive. So actually kind of identify, look, we need probably a mid-level associate here to do X, Y, and Z work. Um, while we're still happy with the overall relationship, they were able to, to use the data to point out, this is kind of driving our costs up. We need to modify and, and, and um, kind of revamp how you're resourcing our work. So that's another example of where kind of, by having those data points, blended rate, resource, task, and role, um, you're able to go into the law firm with a much, instead of a good feel, you're able to go in with objective data and, and set the tone from the start. And what I've seen, with that particular, you know, I was interested to know how it would go because it was one of their first conversations using bright flag data. And the feedback I got was the firm were actually fine with it. Once they could understand the rationale, um, it didn't create much friction at all. They just kind of reformed how they were doing it. And in my mind, that's a good example of moving from reactive to proactive. You're setting the tone at the outset of the matter or maybe when you're, you know, negotiating your new panel of what you expect from your law firms and what value means to you. So that's another kind of example of, of, of using data to help inform your strategies. And maybe in the space of budgeting, Sinead, how have you seen clients take a more nuanced approach to setting, setting their budgets and what impact does that have? Yeah, so, I mean, sometimes like budgeting is obviously, you know, kind of one of the most important ways in which you can help control your costs. Um, sometimes clients think that budget setting is happening but when they actually digitize the whole process they realize actually maybe budgets aren't being applied as 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 much as they had thought and um, one of the really useful ways that our clients have kind of used the platform in the context of budgeting is to actually have the law firm submit budget requests and um, and i think that that's a really clever approach to take because what you're doing is you're bringing the law firm into the process of setting budgets they're part of it and, um, you know, they submit the budget request, it's then either approved or rejected by the um, instructing attorney. But by doing that, you're kind of just making it more of a partnership and kind of bringing more accountability on both sides to how they set budgets. And obviously, you need a tool in order to do that. And and, and that functionality lives in the tool. Um, so that helps you be much more, much more kind of a involved with your firm in terms of setting the budget and then you have much better visibility about how it's how it's progressing and how the spend is aligning with the budget uh, absolutely and um, so so maybe just to recap I, I think obviously the initial objective for legal teams may be to ensure that last mile piece the pro the the reactive tactical controls around billing guideline adherence rates adherence exist in reality, there's much greater benefits very often to be realized in the longer term through that kind of proactive use of the data at the more macro level to improve predictability with the firms, alignment with them about how to best resource the work to deliver the best outcome, and, and obviously in, to improve uh, clarity around pricing expectations uh, in addition to that. So next, uh, we're, we're going to discuss the benefits automation brings to legal operations in freeing up time for the team for more impactful projects and, and work. And I think a common challenge, certainly I hear from legal operations professionals is that a large proportion of their time is being spent on tasks and processes that could ultimately be substantially automated. And there are three key areas where we see this with our clients. Uh, firstly, the invoice review and approval process where certainly leveraging AI can both streamline and automate that process, but also provide greater insights to inform decision making. Secondly, a lot of time can be spent on the engagement with the finance team, and a, a lot can be saved on that crucial handoff between legal and, and finance. Uh, and finally, spend reporting is often cited as one of the major pain points for the legal operations team. Not only is it time consuming to generate the data, there are limits to its usefulness and the insights that it provides. And, and again, AI can not only provide accurate data more quickly, it can also expand essentially the menu of metrics and data points to report on to inform decision-making and, and ultimately drive performance. And when these myriad of time-consuming manual activities exist, 
it impacts individuals' ability to focus on more creative and impactful work, which can be truly drive more kind of step changes or transformation for the legal department as a whole. But it can it can just be very challenging to to free up time for those activities. Um, and again, we were we were eager to get your perspective from the audience as to how much time during the week is being spent completing. Uh, those tasks that you feel could ultimately be automated uh, through technology. Um, uh, so interested to, to get that perspective on, on what proportion of, of time you feel is being spent uh, on tasks that, that could ultimately be automated. And well, again, just give everybody a moment to, to submit their responses there. Uh, this time, guys, if you could focus just on question two, please. So it looks like six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, we have over half in, so I'm gonna I'm gonna end the voting. Thanks, Colin. Okay, share results. So it looks five to fifteen hours. It looks like is. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, so that that's that's what we we typically uh, hear from from legal operations professionals from clients that that is a, a kind of broadly representative of what we see across the customer base prior to implementing a platform of how much uh, of their time is being spent on things which are ultimately capable of automation. And, and what I'm interested to hear from Sinead now is, is really the impact uh, that automation can bring. Um, so Sinead, maybe you might give us a perspective from the, from the legal operations professionals you work directly with. What, what does it mean to them in their roles when, when, when they, they drive much greater automation and free up that time? Yeah, like just, I suppose, to encapsulate what it means, um, more often than not, like actually just one client who I worked with who went live just October, um, we, I worked very closely with the legal ops person in the, in the organization. Um, definitely she was indicative of the listeners here and um, spending hours just chasing invoices, fielding all from queries, trying to keep finance classified. A lot of busy work and um, we obviously when she when we rolled out the platform that automated a lot of that work and she's actually been promoted and um, to a much more kind of strategic role which allows her like you said it allows her to kind of work on initiatives that will actually enable her to make changes in terms of the overall legal team you know the processes that they follow the value that they deliver to the business and the relationships that they derive with the firm so for example now you know she emailed me this week we're looking to start to look at some pricing initiatives that she'll be working with procurement on so she's moved from a place where hours are spent just fielding queries and and living in excels to actually being able to look at the more strategic goals so that at a broad level, um, and it's not the first time that's happened, that's what happens for a legal operations person when they bring in greater automation. If I drop down a little bit, just in terms of these different columns that we talk about, um, in terms of like invoice review, for example, by bringing in automation, by bringing in kind of visibility, I suppose is a big thing and, and transparency, um, you're gonna benefit the entire legal team, but in, in particular, the legal ops person will feel a positive benefit there. So when you bring in a legal spend management platform, you know, your invoice workflows are automated and um, you're no longer living in an email, even more basic uh, benefits. You, you have everything in a digitized place. Now with COVID, with so many people working from home, that's become even more important for people. So having a platform where you can log into and at the touch of a button, you can see where are my invoices? Is there anything stuck? What's been paid? What's been rejected? And also know that you know the corporate requirements are being met and there's automation the whole way through. That just saves a lot of time for a legal ops person and for the overall legal team as well and the relationships that, that derive off that. So 
having automation in invoice review is really important and also notifications to let people know what to do and, and when to do it. And, um, and, and in, in the context of the co collaboration with finance, what are the kind of the key benefits you see there, uh, automation driving? Yeah, with finance, because obviously finance is one of the most important uh, teams that legal will interact with and um, they need to know things very clearly. And sometimes if you're not, you know, if you don't have data to hand, you're very vulnerable when it comes to finance. So where you can have as much automation as, pos as possible and, and kind of real time access to data, you're going to really uh, improve that relationship with finance. So just at a basic level, again, the invoice review process, because it's automated and streamlined, it means that invoices are going to be paid much quicker. So, you know, an example of a client um, who, again, like the poll, spent about 15 hours a week kind of just chasing invoices and, and trying to kind of give some picture to, to finance on, on where they were at. Um, she's now moved into a position where she can actually audit reports. So she can send a report to finance every week, showing them exactly the lay of the land in terms of spend. In addition, with finance, she can kind of give them visibility on, on the accruals, on the budget. All of these things are now at the touch of a button for her to be able to tell finance. That's freed time massively, and it's also kind of improved the relationship with the finance team. Um, so just having that automation, having that real-time data to hand, um, and being able to automate reports based on that means the, the finance interaction is much smoother. And then more holistically, the kind of the reporting cap automated reporting capabilities, what value do you see that driving outside of just the relationship with finance? Sure. Well, like first of all, kind of you if I stand in the shoes of a lot of clients who maybe don't have a system in place and then they put something in place, again, they're moving away from kind of where they maybe were asking law firms to report on things, which is never good. You know, you want to be able to have access to your own data. So you're moving away from kind of relying on people to send you maybe quarterly reports, all in Excels, having to compile them. The data, the accuracy may not be great, and the extent of the data points is quite limited. Whereas when you have a legal spend management platform, when you've implemented something that allows you to actually kind of expand all of the data points that you have, suddenly your reporting capabilities become much more exciting and much more insightful. And um, so in the context of finance, obviously, there's a huge um, benefit in that you can, um, you know, automate accruals reports, automate budget reports, keep them in the know and allow them to see around the corner in terms of what's coming. Um, but you can also start to interact more with your business um, people as well. So you can automate reports to go to your business counterparts so that they can understand where their spend is, you know, spend by firm, spend by work type. And um, that automation and that kind of wider data set will really help um, your relationships with the different stakeholders and also kind of the quality or the, the value that you're providing um, improves significantly when you, when you do that. Yeah, absolutely. And Sinead, obviously your role is increasingly focused on leveraging insights with your customers to drive greater value. In your ex years of experience now in this space, what have you seen in terms of a change in the levels of sophistication of, of what your clients are, are trying to achieve through, through automation? Yeah, like it's it's always surprising me. And um, like when I think about when I worked in a law firm, like the data points just, it would never have been in my mind that certain things that my clients report on now would be even possible. And um, I think, you know, at Bright Flag, what we try and do is bring our, we meet our clients where they're at and bring them on a maturity journey. So in terms of the sophistication, um, what I like is that very quickly clients start to kind of really expand. So they might come in and they might think, OK, I just want to report on like the finance points. But very quickly, as they see the data points open up and um, they start to, for example, have one client now who's kind of got this quarterly framework um, report that they use with their firms. And it rolls in so many different data points, like obviously finance, billing guideline compliance, budgets, the basics like that. But it also brings in qualitative information like, OK, well, what's the quality of the work delivered, the speed? Would I use this firm again? And um, we're also kind of starting to layer in diversity and inclusion metrics in there. So irrespective of your size, um, if you've got a good platform in place, your data points will be quite broad and, and the opportunities are endless. And I'm certainly seeing my clients become more sophisticated by the quarter in terms of reporting and 
it's again everything goes back to relationships it's just helping the relationships whether it's with the law firms with finance or with the business as well by by having those data points to hand well well Sinead, that's certainly a, a great segue to our final key theme that we want to discuss today which is high on the agenda for all legal operations professionals and legal teams building stronger relationships with key stakeholders um, and and certainly in our mind uh, there are three key relationships uh, and, and we're going to discuss those uh, today. Firstly, the relationship with the finance team. You already alluded to that quite a bit and its importance. Secondly, the relationship with external providers, the law firms and service providers. Uh, and finally, the relationship with your business departments as the ultimate consumer of legal services. Um, again, before we get Sinead's perspective on this, uh, we'd love to understand from all of your perspective, what relationship are you most determined to get right? Um, so again, we might just run the, the final poll. I'm, I'm not sure if we, we already have the results on that one, Colin. Or um, Yeah, that one, it's even reported on already. It looks like uh, external vendors is uh, a winner with a close second business departments. Yeah, that, that, that's interesting and, and slightly surprising. Um, often we hear um, the relationship with finance is pretty critical uh, for a, a lot of legal operations professionals. Uh, certainly uh, the relationship with law firms, their trusted advisors, in-house lawyers themselves obviously highly value those relationships um, and, and, and place a heavy emphasis on them. But, but I think it's, it's unsurprising to see the, the focus on that relationship with the business being, being so, so critical. So what we might do is start with the relationship with the finance team. And as many of us know, what finance ultimately want from legal is predictability and confidence in the controls and processes that have been implemented um, uh, while receiving accurate and timely reporting. Sinead, firstly, in your experience, what does good look like in the relationship between legal and finance? I think, you know, the word we've used a lot today is proactive. Ultimately, legal work is always going to be a hard one to control and to say with absolute certainty where you're going to land. But if you can be proactive with your finance team and if you can give them the visibility in terms of the trends that are happening within your within your spend pool, um, then you're going to strengthen the relationship. So access to timely, real-time information, access to accruals so that they can understand what to expect, um, and also kind of, uh, you know, a, a view on how the team is doing overall uh, in relation to the budget. So if you're able to kind of feed that information into finance, if you're able to structure reports in such a way that you are every month or every week, whatever the frequency is, you're giving them the information that they want to know you know, you're moving away from a defense place where you're like reactive and finance are calling out to you and you just don't know to being proactive, say, look, this is where we're at. These are the risks and this is what we've accrued and this is what we expect in the next month. If you can do that, then that makes the relationship with finance, I think, much smoother. And feedback I've had from clients is by just being able to give that information into finance, it, it's helped the relationship and helps the dynamic. Um, and then just from a hygienic perspective, having clearer processes in terms of actual physical payment of invoices that really helps as well so integrations with finances is important too uh, absolutely and, and certainly in my experience it's generally the case that the finance team play a critical role in the evaluation of any change to legal spend management or matter management processes and okay. system changes um, and, and what they want to ensure is that controls exist reporting is accurate and timely um, and, and as you've spoken about what they're looking for is a greater degree of predictability on legal spend and we've certainly seen new new capabilities we've launched enabling departmental budgeting with AI powered forecasting within it giving giving legal leadership and legal operations greater greater comfort and greater certainty in, in predicting how the how the, the, the year is going to unfold. Uh, ensuring all of that data is being pulled together into one place, the accruals information, the invoice information, upcoming matters um, uh, that they may not have visibility on yet. And and, and, and I suppose the final thing I, I, I certainly see with finance teams is what they're looking for is confidence in the spend management platform and certainly SOC 1 certification, validating the robustness of cost control uh, controls that exist, 
uh, tends to increase that that degree of confidence and be be an important point for for the finance team. So moving on to the relationship with outside law firms and service providers, as as we saw from the survey results, this this is a, a high priority um, for for the audience. And, and as I said, I think that tends to be the case across the industry, particularly for the in-house lawyers themselves within the legal functioning who are so dependent on these, these trusted external uh, vendors. And certainly our philosophy, which, which is shared by our customers, is that stronger, more transparent relationships can be built with law firms which are underpinned by data and metrics uh, and where strong processes exist. Again, Sinead, what value do you see this delivering to both the law firms and the legal department uh, in your experience? Like, I think by you know, just the basic thing of um, having visibility, right, and having kind of clear processes in place, you're going to really enhance the relationship with your law firm. So you move from a place where, like I said, you know, before, where your law firm maybe sends an invoice, it has, nobody's picked it up, um, it's two months down the line and, you know, suddenly the law firm is 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 kind of shouting for payment of the invoice, which is completely understandable. And um, that's not a good place to be in, particularly with one of your most strategically important partners, right? So by having a system in place where there's much more visibility and transparency for both the law firm and the legal team, you're going to smooth that relationship. And probably one of the most important changes I see is that you move from a place where you're kind of worrying about those those kind of administrative pieces in terms of payment to actually focusing in on the value that the law firm is delivering. You know, a law firm, as we always say, it's not like any kind of type of supplier arrangement. They are so fundamental to the legal team, how the legal team interacts with the business and the value that they deliver into the business. So the relationship between the law firm and the legal team has to be solid. And when you put in a system in place, um, first of all, you're going to help the law firms actually be paid, which is a really important thing in a timely fashion, and they can see where they're tracking. Um, but also, you're going to be able to focus in your conversations on the actual value that's being delivered, on the strategy that you as a legal team want them as a as a as a important partner to adopt. So I, I've had clients, so a, a large insurer, for example whose relationships, you know, they really rely on the law firm to, to, to guide them as they're going through litigations, particularly in, in, in the context of settlements, right? And they said that they moved from a place where the quarterly meeting was often about fees and unpaid fees to actually focusing in on, okay, well, look, this is the strategy that we as a legal team want to adopt and we want you to partner with us. And it freed up the, the time to actually just focus in on the things that were really strategic and important for both sides. And we have the word transparent evaluation there. Sometimes I think people worry that, you know, having a, a AI powered uh, invoice review tool will maybe rock the boat, but actually it's it's the reverse. Uh, you know, if you can say your firm on a really objective basis, layering in maybe other firms on an anonymous basis, that this is how you're doing, this is where you're at, this is what's working well, and maybe this is what needs to be improved. That's a really important conversation to have. And for me personally, seeing my client use the data and mature, that's a really lovely thing to see because the relationship benefits immensely when they have that transparent evaluation there and they have that kind of framework in place and the noise around other kind of administrative stuff is reduced so that they can really focus in on, on the strategic value. So, so it sounds like Shane, obviously defining the key metrics you're going to evaluate all of your law firms against, whether it's billing guideline adherence, budget adherence, diversity and inclusion is something Colin obviously has mentioned, and 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 we're we're enabling the capture of that data uh, related to law firms through the platform, as well as obviously qualitative feedback on the quality of legal service provided on matters. So, bringing that data together having a clear picture of how the, the law firm are performing against all of those those different criteria. And that's obviously building subjective feedback from your, your in-house team as to how they feel the law firm performed on individual matters uh, and having the ability to kind of bring all that data together at the kind of macro level to understand the overall health of that relationship. And I think something really important you honed in on is that transparency with the firm, that you're not kind of holding that information back and ultimately giving the firm, firm a nasty surprise in your next panel evaluation process yes. where they get removed from 
well, sharing it with them so that they have the opportunity to address the concerns, understand areas for improvement, whether it's quarterly or biannually. Uh, what, what, what frequency would you see clients typically kind of engaging with the law firms at that level, uh, sharing that type of information? Um, I typically see a quarterly, actually, um, particularly when they have the data and they've got that kind of dynamic going where it's an open feedback loop. Um, quarterly is, is a good, is a good um, basis for that. Yeah, it's like it's just it, it really enhances the relationship and makes it much more um, valuable on both sides, I think, actually. Yeah. And certainly in my experience, to our first point about getting to that proactive state, I think, this is where you start to have the data to understand is the right firm doing the right work? Are they using the right resource to do it? Um, um, and, and when you have that information at your disposal, it makes it much easier to, to start making those types of decisions in a way that is fair and, and transparent and, and is taking account of all of the data points that should inform your, your overarching resourcing strategy. I'm, I'm conscious of time. We could spend the whole uh, session yeah. talking about relationship uh, with vendors um, uh, I know it's a it's a topic uh, close to both of our hearts um, but maybe finally discussing the relationship with the business and the business departments they're obviously the ultimate consumer of legal services very often and and I know certainly the reason many in-house lawyers found their way in-house in the first place is to become true partners to the business to help drive its success with strategic advice so what are the key ways you've seen the legal team build stronger relationships with the business? Yeah, well, like all of the things we've discussed today, it's actually kind of, you know, the use of data and transparent evaluation. Um, ultimately, what business cares about is they want the outcome, right? So they want to make sure that the right outcome is achieved in a timely fashion and the quality of, of service delivery is high. As a legal team, what you want to be is integrated with those business departments. So you want to like kind of use the data to help, you know, help them understand what's driving the instructions, what's driving the costs, who's providing value and, and kind of give them data around outcomes. Right. And if you can do that, then you're going to be you're going to be like probably sometimes what can happen. I've heard is that like, you know, legal teams are the they hear things last. Whereas if you can become a trusted advisor with the business and use the data to help them understand, I think you're in a much stronger, you know, you're going to build that relationship in a much stronger way. And there's lots of correlation, like what we've talked about, they're all so intricate. Like, so what we talked about in the first section about being active and negotiating good um, terms with your law firms. And then also what we talked about building good relationships with your law firms, all of those things help the business achieve their outcomes and will help you you know, strengthen that relationship with the business because you're managing the risk, you're managing the law firms, and ultimately giving them a good outcome. That's what they care about. And the data that underpins that and the and the discussions that you have will, will strengthen the relationship with business. And um, you want to, like we say here as well, you want to be a strategic advisor and um, you want to give guidance and the law firm can help you do that. And the relationship needs to be strong there. And then the data that you have needs to be pumped into the business so that it all, it's all quite circular in, in that regard. And over time, just the trust builds. Uh, and, and certainly, I think, tied to our conversation around kind of advanced automation, freeing up the time of the team uh, to, to be doing that value-add work with the business, getting closer to it, being more proactive in providing the, the right advice uh, by, by driving greater automation. Uh, on the one hand, freeing up time from kind of administrative work and in addition to that, ensuring the right resource is doing the right type of work so you don't have experienced in-house lawyers doing work that should be outsourced to an alternative service provider at a much lower cost base, uh, that, that certainly helps the business and helps the in-house lawyers in their job satisfaction in, in, in the value that, that they're driving as well. Um, I, I, and I think you've seen, Sinead, some pretty practical examples of how the data can be kind of leveraged by the legal team in, in, in informing ultimate business strategy decisions in, in areas as yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like just one example with insurance again, actually that point. And um, when they brought in the the platform and they got access to the data, it actually informed, you know, their approaches to settlements. Um, and they found themselves being brought to more and more business meetings um, so that they could actually give that kind of strategic advice around the best time to settle was um, the best approaches to take. So 
having the data, like I said, it's the data and, and being able to contextualize it as a legal advisor and, and give comfort to the business that, you know, the best, the best path is being followed. When you can do that, you're in a really strong place as, as an in-house lawyer. And something interesting, Sinead, I think both of us are, are, are hearing from customers at the moment is obviously diversity and inclusion initiatives are key strategic objectives for the business as a whole. What, what are you seeing in terms of the role legal can play as part of that kind of broader um, strategy for, for the organization? Yeah, it's actually working to the advantage of the legal team massively having um, a tool that will enable them to collect the data um, because you know diversity and inclusion it's relatively new and some businesses at, at a whole um, are struggling to maybe meet the quotas whereas legal teams with law firms you know engaging in it actually do really well at that they can collect data quite easily and report on it so I'm seeing some of my clients actually in a position where they're one of the better business departments or better teams within the business actually reporting on diversity and inclusion. Uh, one in particular has been held out as kind of, you know, the, the leader or the, the one to look up to in, in within the organization. So having the tools in place to easily do that really helps the, the legal team within the business. Yeah, absolutely. And certainly something close to our, our heart here at Bright Flag. Um, we certainly share that philosophy that diverse teams drive ultimately drive better business outcomes as well. Um, that, that's great, Sinead. Thank you. Thank you for sharing uh, sharing those insights. I'm, I'm mindful of time and want to make sure we're, we're leaving some time for, for questions at the end. Maybe to kind of to read firstly, um, really what we've been talking it's focusing on on value uh, that the legal department can deliver rather than just honing in on cost savings and we're certainly seeing more and more clients moving towards more, more proactive spend management strategies automating more and more activities to free and energy for more high impact work and certainly certainly building successfully more transparent data-driven relationships with their finance colleagues with the law firms and with the business itself and ultimately all of that driving better business outcomes and enabling the legal team to be a better business partner uh, one one thing to note um we, we are uh, going to share a, a guide um i, I think uh, colin will, will share it in the, in the chat uh, channel uh, this gives further details on all the fundamentals you need to essentially more proactive legal spend management and and set the scene for operational and kind of relational ripple effects we introduced today and and some of the kind of heavy lifting that needs to be done to enable you to get there and um, so certainly from our perspective we myself and Sinead thank you so much everyone for your time um, and, and we're certainly uh, delighted to, to take uh, any questions that that everybody has uh, now and I, I know they can be shared through the chat function um, so let me see uh, the first question here um do you feel that in-house legal ops departments can set staffing levels on on an on an hourly on hourly litigation matters and um, so Sinead, yeah, i might i might uh, get your perspective on that one what you're seeing with clients whether the legal ops team yeah I, yeah sure like i think again um It'll, you know, you have to do like with like, but I have certainly seen legal ops when they get the access to the data and they start to see norms. I have, particularly actually in the area, the area of IP, I have seen the legal ops teams start to mandate that certain resourcing levels should be applied. Similarly, in the context of AFAs, I've seen legal ops teams and legal ops um, leaders actually kind of take, there's low hanging fruit, right? So there's certain types of litigation that would be harder to do this but there's certain IP and um, also property work I've seen legal ops teams um, go in and negotiate or set the tone in terms of what the expectation is around resourcing so certainly it's possible um, and it's very much so possible in kind of um, certain types of, of legal work within litigation. Yeah, and certainly at the heart of the Bride Flag platform is an AI powered engine that is reading and understanding all that invoicing data and very granularly classifying how much time is being spent on a litigation matter, for instance, on an individual motion on the discovery phase in its totality, what level that work is being resourced at, how much time is being spent there. And I agree with what Sinead has said, and we're certainly seeing clients become much more proactive in 
in some instances looking to disaggregate the litigate large litigation matters, building the business case to use alternative service providers, fixed cost basis for components of the discovery exercise, or at least mandating the level that um, certain activities should be resourced at and, and having those kind of open conversations with the relationship partner and the law firm where there's overstaffing at a partner level on, on more tactical components, for instance, of managing the litigation once they have visibility on that. So, so thanks for that. That was a, a great question. Um, uh, another question here, uh, what tools can we use for automation from both sides, clients as well as law firms? Um, so, so certainly um, uh, on, on that one, um, there's obviously a growing ecosystem of, of technology that's that's being used. Um, part of our platform is a collaboration tool where, whereby law firms have access to a portal where they can submit matter data, submit budgeting data, as Sinead mentioned. Uh, they can have visibility on key data points uh, relating to the matter, share updates on them, um, as, as well as submitting that invoicing and accruals information. And that, that obviously is facilitating um, greater visibility for everybody involved in those matters um, and, and, and uh, ultimately better, better conversations when, when issues do arise uh, and, and the ability to kind of head them off at the pass uh, by having early visibility on them. Um, another question here, uh, do you think law firms should draft some pre-checks prior to invoice submission um, from, from billing guidelines? wherein they can avoid various rejections and errors. Uh, Sinead, I might pass this one over to you. I know you've, you've spent a fair amount of time engaging with, with law firms as well. Mm, this. Yeah, yeah. like I personally advise clients because this has come up as a question. I, I think that it's better to allow the invoice to flow through. If, if the law firm goes and does pre-checks, first of all, it's going to be additional work on their part. One of the things that we talk about at Brightflight is that billing behaviour change. Um, while there may be some rejections at the start, it's nearly better just to have the invoice go through and, and very quickly, you know, the, the behaviour will change when there's that interaction with the legal team as well. Um, I think, yeah, pre-checks prior to invest, like ideally uh, what you're trying to instill with your law firm is they're thinking about value and, and how they bill you at the time. Um, if that's not the case, um, it does change relatively quickly um, when you allow the invoice to flow through the normal cycle. So I think it's best to, to do that. Um, you know, it it uh, it kind of, it lends itself to the learning uh, behind the process as well, or the, the change in behavior. That's how I would advise my clients to do with that. Yeah, absolutely. And certainly transparency cut, cuts both ways in that you, you ideally want the law firms to be providing you with the, the context of actually how the work was, was delivered and resourced. So that you, as you say, Sinead, you can then have those conversations with them about how those behaviours need to improve, whether they're overstaffing calls with with too many lawyers, uh, whether they've got duplication of effort in, in how they're they're drafting uh, agreements or documentation, or as we've spoken about, over resourcing at a partner level. Uh, those things become apparent, and and very often for our clients, they've got better data than their law firms do to evaluate those things. Mm -hmm. and, and Relationship partners are very open to uh, uh, happy to have those conversations and, and get that feedback because their ultimate goal is to maintain long standing relationships with their clients. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, I I, I, I'm mindful of time, Sinead. Sorry, you, you were going to say something there? Oh, no, I, I thought I saw another question, but I think it's actually the same one. So. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think um, I, I, I think the final question might be getting at that point. Is it still important to do some basic checks uh, on the invoices, uh, Sinead, that are submitted to uh, to the legal department? What, what's your perspective on that in terms of the automated application of billing guidelines and the kind of a review and approval of an individual invoice that is submitted by by team members? Well, I think that um, oh yeah, there's always value in doing basic checks, even you know linked back to the finance piece you know there's certain requirements that law firms will have to meet like maybe specifying an entity or a po number on the invoice and um, obviously like you know bright flag or other platforms will help verify that and, and check it and um, it's always worth doing it is important to do a basic check to ensure that you're not creating bottlenecks but to your point alex like the transparency and and i think allowing for things to feed through and, and learning from the data is also a big benefit yeah i, I think um the power of the technology is, is kind of highlighting those potential inefficiencies or issues that may need to be addressed 
rather than necessitating a line by line review of the entirety of an individual invoice. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Great. You guys, um, I thank you so much. I just want to say that was like phenomenal. There's, there's a reason why Bright Flag is getting so much traction. You guys are really kind of, you know, educating the market. This, this is, this is uh, phenomenal stuff. Really, really, really appreciate it. I have so many questions myself that we'll probably bring this on for about five or six more hours talking about like uh, predictable analytics. I'd like to get into that with you guys sometime. I know you alluded to it earlier on, but the other, the, the diversity and inclusion, you talked a lot about data points and I see, I see on its face the strength you have with your data points. But you know, how, how are you solving for the market? Right now, everybody's woke, right? The diversity and inclusion. And the first thing for them to do is to run to the ABA survey, get a bunch of questions, you know, pepper the law firms with the answers. Like, I feel like that you're kind of more nuanced. You got those data points already. Uh, like, how, how, are you, how are you approaching this? And how are you, how are you, how are you from, you know, a, a company approaching the diversity, you know, angle and get, getting the right data points to the right people? And is it a customer by customer basis or is it going to be holistically solving for everybody? Yeah, it's a great question, Pell. And certainly the philosophy of our work continually launching new capabilities within the platform and our approach is to listen to our customers and understand what they're trying to achieve and make it as easy as possible for them to do that through the platform. So what we have enabled is the automated capture of diversity and inclusion data from their law firms and legal service providers. So they've got a very clear understanding of uh, and picture of uh, the, the diversity of the teams working on their own matters. And, and obviously what that enables then is the, the overarching DNI strategy where there may be very specific uh, diversity targets that are being set and law, law firms are being held to account to. Um, that data, as, as, as Sinead alluded to, is, is then being openly shared with the firm as to how they're benchmarking against other firms on that target as part of those quarterly relationship review meetings. But uh, I'm a firm believer in, 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 in this ultimately informing the makeup of the panel of law firms so that as we spoke about, it's not just considering which firm is the most cost effective or providing the best quality legal service, but this is a, another key criteria that's, that's informing that ultimate decision. And I'm sure everyone saw the, the general counsel of Coca-Cola's guidelines, which I think are a great a great uh, benchmark in the industry for for uh, what can be achieved or, or what um, what law firms can be asked to do and, and and the positive impact that can ultimately have. And and what we're simply trying to do is is make it as easy as possible to have visibility on that data to to inform those conversations with firms and ultimately those decisions about about how work has been resourced. So, so it's going to be a different way of doing things. It's going to be more of an on-demand access to information as opposed to like annual, right, to get the same information. Co correct. Yeah, the, the client can determine the frequency at which they're they're capturing that data from their, their law firms. Yeah. Love it. I have so many questions, but we've got two minutes left. But can I jump in and ask one, one issue that really killed me when I was in practice doing this, like le building out legal ops functions, was the accrual process and the tedious nature of dealing with finance teams having to you know weekly on the accruals right every month you're meeting with them and then you're trying to solve for that like how does bright flag solve or automate that process because that would that would be a win right away for me like 10 out of 10. Sinead do you want to take that one? <laughs> yeah sure so in terms of in terms of how we do it yeah like we have a lot of clients that like literally we have 20 excels coming in every week from law firms who are at pains to do it it's again automation so we've opened up the law firm so the law firm portal which the, the the law firms have access to they'll be able to go in they can do it you know at a matter by matter level or what most of them elect to do is just this book upload so almost everything is there for them just to populate the key financial uh, points of information they can leave any comments that they have um, and then from the client's perspective, there's actually very little work on their part. It's basically just they get a scheduled report on the first working day of the month to say this is your accruals report. If they want, they can have the added uh, control of reviewing the accruals. And some of our clients do elect to have that. Um, but others will just say, look, whatever the law firms have submitted, we will accept as an accrual. Um, and it's, it's fully automated for them. It's really just the delivery of a report. So they go from having multiple firms emailing them to just one consolidated email and some of them just send it on to finance directly so 
Wow. Uh, I, 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 I need to go back to the future. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. And I think the final piece of the puzzle on that, Colin, is, is the environmental budgeting when our, our platform enables a kind of a centralized picture bringing together all those different strands, the invoice amounts, the matter level budgets, the accruals information to give legal leadership a very clear picture of where they are. And our, our data science team have, have layered in our AI capabilities there as well, whereby it's giving you a prediction of where you're going to actually end up at the end of the year against that that forecast and that budget that you've set. Well, I know we that's talked about real, it. Sorry, sorry. sorry Sinead. That's Go the ahead. real round picture then. When they log in there, they can see everything and then some AI powered predictions too. So that's moves the dog for them. Yeah, I know we talked about it earlier, but um, yeah, I'm I'm looking for a refresh on that that demo from from earlier. Um, yeah, I I just want to thank everybody. Uh, I know we're coming to the top of the hour, but thank you very very much for your time today. We really appreciate it, and we know it's valuable, so we want to give you kind of real content that can help you. And um, I just want to thank Sinead and Alex again. I'm going to leave the last word with you guys to, you know, sign off. It, it, we did we did we did leave. Uh, I'm taking the last word, by the way. <laughs> we, did, we did in the chat. We did leave a, a link uh, for, for to sign sign up. We'll follow up with uh, we'll follow up with the uh, PowerPoint, and we'll follow up with the recording of this session. Last word, Sinead, Alex. Thank yeah, just you very to, much. just to thank everyone. Yeah, it's been it's, uh, it's been uh, really enjoyable. Enjoy the conversation, and uh, if Bright Flag can can be of any assistance in spend and matter management, uh, we're we're here to help. And they got three Irish people today. Would you believe that? Like in, in legal tech, isn't this amazing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, what's, that three strike, what's that? Three strikes, we're in trouble. You know, it's like. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Thanks very much. See you again. Bye. Looking forward Bye, yeah. to working with you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Colin. Take care. Bye.